Hey, well, nothing like making a great entrance over there, but anyhow, yes, I did enjoy my trip. <coughs> uh, so anyhow, but happy 4th of July, and welcome back again. Um, I don't know how you did last night, but there was plenty of fireworks, right? I guess they had no big fireworks, but they had fireworks. Every did anybody else have fireworks in their neighborhood? Yeah, like everybody, right? Right? So it was a crazy night, and even a night before, and I get it because... Uh, uh, we don't have any uh, legal fireworks, so there were all these illegal fireworks. And we all got to celebrate uh, the United States of America, right? In fact, in fact, how many of you know what, where the Pledge of Allegiance... Anybody know where the Pledge of Allegiance came from? I hope not. I know I didn't. Uh, maybe I don't hope not. I mean, that would be great if you do. You're just smarter than me. I had to look it up. And actually, it was written in 1892 uh, by a pastor... Uh, the then pastor, a Baptist pastor, Francis Bellamy, uh, in 1892. And so what happened in 1892? Anybody know what that would be? That would actually be, not the year, but actually 400 years before that. That's when Christopher Columbus discovered America. So as part of a celebration of the 400th, 400th discovery of America by Christopher Columbus, he wrote the Pledge of Allegiance. And not necessarily the Pledge of Allegiance to the United States, supposedly, but actually a pledge that was intended to be a pledge to any country. And so the original uh, Pledge of Allegiance said this, I pledge allegiance to my flag and the republic for which it stands, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. So what's missing? Well, yes. but uh, Yes. What else is missing? I pledge allegiance to the... Yes, of the United States. So actually, that got added not until 1923, the flag of the United States. So as I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. But you said there was something else missing, right? And that was what? Under God, which wasn't added until 1954 in response to the communist threat by President Eisenhower. So that's our 31-word pledge of allegiance today. I pledge of allegiance to my flag, the United States of America and the Republic, for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. But here's the thing. It seems like more than any time in history, and certainly in recent history, we don't seem like a very united state, do we? And I'm not sure that we even are a United States under God. And maybe we never were. Maybe that was just actually a desired expression, that we would be a United States, and that would be a United States under God. And maybe we were actually at one time, maybe during World War I, or perhaps sometimes during World War II, or maybe, maybe even after 9-11, we were a little more of a United States, and we were a little more of a United States, perhaps under God, but not today. Not today. In fact, maybe today we're more of a divided states of America. Politically, racially, socially, economically, and even religiously, we're more divided now than ever before. And it's not just at the macro level, but it's also at the individual level or at the micro level. Presidential candidates who talk about uniting the nation while fighting among themselves. Between the protesters and the police. Between members sometimes, maybe even of the fam same family. In fact, I bet there are some issues today that have you, you and your friends or you and members of your family and maybe even you and members of the church divided today. I remember actually when I was younger and earlier in ministry, the division was over what kind of music to listen to. So we only listened to choruses in the evening and we listened to and we sang hymns in the morning. All right. And I had a dear little lady one time come up to me after I had led some choruses. She pointed her finger into my chest, actually pressed it into my chest and said, you know better than that. And I said, better than what? Better than to sing those choruses. So sometimes even in the church, there's division. And, and here's the thing. I think we have to be careful as a church that we don't let division reach in to divide things to divide us, whether it's face masks or whether it's music or whatever it might be, because Satan is really creative and really good right now at dividing us. But here's the thing. Where does division come from? 
And what are the solutions? Because as I said, division is all around us. And, and, and so where does it come from and what is the solution? Well, I love what uh, Senator Tim Scott said, the U.S. Senator from actually South Carolina recently, a week ago, in an interview with Pastor Greg Laurie. He said, as a born-again believer, I am, devi- I am driven by the gospel of Jesus Christ, so I don't look for a black solution or a white solution or a blue solution. I look for, a, will you say it with me? A God solution. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. And he, said, he went on to say, and that means I have to start there in there, and in the middle, stay there. So here's the thing. What is God's solution to the divided United, to the divided states of America? What is God's solution to the divided state of the church? What is God's solution to the divided state of your heart? Well, interestingly enough, God, in his wisdom, has placed it right here in the middle of this study that we've been doing and looking at during this summer in a series called James, A Spiritual Toolkit for Life. And so I'm not going to ask you to stand, but I am going to ask you to read it with me, and I'm so glad to have somebody to read it with me, all right? (laughs) And also to have somebody once in a while to laugh at my jokes besides Carol. So so turning your Bibles, she does really good, but she probably gets tired of it too. So turning your Bibles with me to James this morning, James chapter 4, and we're going to read just verses 1 through 10, and we're only going to get through a little bit of this today, and we're going to get through the rest of it next Sunday, so be sure to come and to join us again. But James chapter 4, verses 1 through 10, that's our text this morning. Again, you can stay seated, but let's read it together. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves, therefore, before the Lord, and he will exalt you. As I said, James in this passage and in this chapter gives us what I think is the three things. One is the cause for conflict, whether it's in the church, in the world, or in yourself. Second is the consequences of conflict. And third, if you're taking notes, is the cure for conflict. And the cure is what we're going to talk about next week. This week we're just going to talk about the causes and also about the consequence. First, the cause of the conflict. Notice it's back in James chapter 4, verse 1. He says, what causes quarrels and fights, and what causes fights among you? A penetrating question. But before we answer it, will you notice just a couple of things with me? First of all, look what he, how he describes this conflict and division. He says, first, it's quarrels, and second, it's fights. Simply said, quarrels here is the more general word for conflict or warfare. And quarrels is the more specific word or narrow term for individual skirmishes and individual battles. So it would be like talking about the Civil War or World War I or II. That's, that's the quarrels. And it would be talking about individual battles or skirmishes within those wars. That would be the fights. But now notice there's a second use, second thing that he notes here. And that is it's not just what causes a quarrel. What causes a conflict? What causes a fight? But what causes plural? What causes quarrels? War after war, World War I, World War II, and we could go on and on and on and on, and we could have begun sooner than that. And then what causes fights with it? fights? And so what he's saying here is what causes this ongoing battle, either in a country or in our hearts or in even a church? 
And then thirdly, notice who it's who he's addressing. Who he's addressing this this cure to. Who he's addressing the consequences to, and it's and it's to the church. What causes fights again among who? Among you. This would be a reference to the suffering and scattered saints of the church of Pastor James in Jerusalem, and also, I think, to us as well. So notice, this isn't a conflict that we're talking about between Democrats and Republicans, between blue and between red, or between black or between white, or between men or between women, but rather it's a conflict or a division between brothers and sisters in the church. And yes, it's possible, isn't it? In fact, if you look through almost every one of the New Testament churches, you'll discover the church in Corinth struggled with conflict in the church. In 1 Corinthians 3, 4, Paul says, you guys are divided. Some of you say you like, some of you say you're, 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 you like Pastor Carlo. Some of you say you like Felix. Some of you say you like Justin. And none of you say you like Pastor Denny, but that's okay. That's not what he says, but you get what he says, because what does he say? 1 Corinthians 3, 4, he says, when one of you says, I am a follower of Paul, and another says, I'm a follower of Apollos, aren't you acting just like people of the world who've divided yourselves, who've, who've said you have certain favorites and that's who you're going to follow? And what Paul goes on to say is we need to just follow Christ, not, not these men. And so there was conflict in the church in Corinth. I think there was even conflict at, at dinner, at the public meetings, you know, at communion when they had supper together. And some were saying, well, I like Katie's uh, potato salad, you know. Well, you know, I like, I, I like Joan's potato salad and better. I don't know what it was they were exactly fighting over, but they were fighting. It was such an intense thing. That, and there were, that there were divisions in 1 Corinthians eleven eighteen. 18. First, I hear that there are divisions among you. And when you meet as a church, and to some extent, I believe it. And then he says, and it's so bad that you guys are suing each other. Again, 1 Corinthians 6, 1 through 8, and chapter 14, he says, when one of you has a dispute with another believer, how dare you, how, how dare you file a lawsuit and ask a secular court to decide the matter instead of taking it to other believers? And, 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 and so I get it, because the church in Corinth was filled with all kinds of problems anyhow, but how about the church in Galatia? The church in Galatia, Paul says, some of you are so mad at each other that you're biting and devouring one another. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you're not consumed by one another. There was such conflict that they were no doubt talking behind their backs and spreading rumors and biting, as I said, and devouring. And maybe not always behind their back. And even Paul's favorite church, at least that's what I think it is, his favorite church, the church of Philippi, he said, some of you are having problems too. They were having problems submitting to one another. So he says, complete my joy. Make my joy complete, Philippians 2, by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, getting along with one another with one mind. And then notice he says the bravest thing I've ever heard a pastor say. It's in chapter 4. He says, and he calls them out. I entreat you, Eodia, and, and you, Syntyche, to agree in the Lord. Two women were disagreeing in the church. That's a dangerous thing for anybody to actually call out, but he does. Because there was conflict in the church. So we understand, but now where's it come from? Where does conflict, division, quarreling, and fighting come from? Well, we'll be tempted to think that quarreling and fights comes from the outside, from false brothers. You know, from false teachers who or heretics who's crept in, or, or, or from what one of my favorite pastors, Matt Chandler, said, from your crazy uncle or your loony mother-in-law. I had an uncle, bless his heart, uh, who was an evangelist, and I loved him. He was one of my favorite and fun, funnest uncles, but I tell you, we would always get in arguments, and he just loved it. And I wasn't too fond of it, but he loved it. So we would argue, and we'd argue over things that, you know, uh, usually doctrinal things, and sometimes not so doctrinal things. But here's the thing. I, I figured that finally we would have to come to the conclusion that we're just going to have to wait to heaven, wait till we get to heaven to find out who's right. And what's exciting is he's in heaven, and now he knows I'm right. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know if I was right maybe once in a while, but I'm sure he was too. So the thing is, we're tempted to think that quarrels and fights come from the outside, from your loony mother-in-law or your crazy uncle, or from false teachers, or from Satan. But notice what James says. It doesn't come from any of those, does it? It comes from within you. 
James 4, 1b says, is, not this, is it not this that your passions are at war within you? That it's within you? And I think that's a reference to the church collectively, but I think it's also a reference to us individually. And notice Paul doesn't let up, or James doesn't let up here when it talks about who's responsible for things. In fact, if you, if, if you go back, you also realize that, so the point here is that J, what James is saying is that the cause of, a, of, of constant quarrels and fightings has nothing to do with what's going on around you. The cause of constant quarrels and fights has nothing to do with what's going on around you, but rather it has everything to do with what's going on inside you. And James is good at this, as I said. He's always bringing back the blame or the responsibility or the culpability of sin back on us. We can't blame Satan for temptation. Remember that in James chapter 1? He said, you can't blame the devil for that. He said, you're drawn away, you're drawn away to sin when your own lust and desire. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. And further, he says that the source of worldly wisdom that results in disorder and every vile deed that we looked at or practice we looked at is our bitter jealousy and our selfish ambition. So it's our sin nature. And James continues this theme of blaming us and our human condition for the quarrels and fights that take place among brothers and sisters in the church. But now what is it within us? What is it within us that causes conflict or quarrels. It is our passions that are at war within us. And the word passions here is actually a word that I think we're acquainted with. It's a Greek word called hedonin. And it simply means pleasures or enjoyments, literally enjoyments. It's, it's, it's the desire to have things that many times are legitimate, a desire for relationship, a desire for food, for leisure, and even for the necessities of life. So there's nothing inherently wrong with your desires. But it's when you want those desires more than you want God and more than you want peace with one another. When we want our selfish desires, when we want our way, and when we're not willing to submit to others, and most importantly and most soberly, we're not willing to submit to God. Quarrels and fightings come then when everyone wants what pleases themselves more than what pleases others or what pleases God. I'll read it again. Quarrelings and fightings come when everyone wants what pleases themselves more than what pleases others or pleases God. When we want our selfish ways. Uh, the other day, I, I've, I've enjoyed, one thing I've enjoyed about COVID about, uh, is that it seems like there's less traffic and so people don't seem like they're in quite so much of a hurry. And I haven't heard many horns, many people blowing their horns at people until the other day. Until the other day when I was sitting at the exit ramp and there was somebody in front of me. And a guy comes zooming off the exit ramp behind me. And, he, and, and the light had just turned green. And that guy, while he's zooming around the ramp, is just laying on his horn. You know, I mean, the light did turn green, but just a millisecond ago. And somehow, I guess the idea is we got in this way. And maybe here's the thing. Maybe he was on his way to the hospital. His wife was pregnant, and she was due to deliver any moment. I don't know why he was in such a hurry. I think it might have just been the passions, the desire to get ahead, the desire, the selfish desire to have his way and to get everybody else to move out of the way. And that's where wars and conflict in the church and life come from, our selfish desires. And now notice the consequences of conflict. There are several. First, there are murderous thoughts towards others. You desire and you do not have, so you do what? You murder. And I, I'm, I'm, but you say, I've never murdered, and chances are you haven't. And it would be better if you didn't tell me, because I'd have to turn you in. But have you ever been angry with someone? Have you ever laid on your horn like that because somebody got in your way or because somebody wouldn't let you do what you wanted to do or somebody didn't want to paint something the color you wanted to paint it or somebody didn't want to go to the restaurant you wanted to go? Those, those illustrations are, have never happened in my house. <laughs> Just I, I've seen that in other marriages, okay? And so you, you get angry with someone. And what does the Bible have to say about that? What does Jesus have to say about that? Well, if you have your Bible, you can turn to me in Matthew 
In chapter 5, verse 21 and 22, Jesus says, You've heard that it said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable of judgment. But Jesus raises the bar. He says, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable of judgment or guilty of murder. The same thing John said. John said in 1 John 3, 15, Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And let's be honest, every crime in the world, in this world, has come from desire, which was first only a feeling in the heart, but which, after being nourished long enough, resulted in saying some kind of unkind word or doing some unthinkable deed. For example, David's passions drew him to, drew him to do what? To kill someone, right? To murder Uriah, Bathsheba's husband. And there's a great story, I shouldn't say great story, an incredibly sobering story in 2 Kings chapter 21, a story about how Jezebel actually had Naboth, a guy who had a, a wine or a vineyard uh, next to the king's palace, and the king wanted it, but Naboth didn't want to give it to him, so Jezebel said, for crying out loud, you're the king, you can have whatever you want, and so she decided as a birthday present, some kind of present anyhow, that she would actually just have Naboth killed and then be able to give the vineyard to her husband. And so our selfish desires, again, result in murderous, murderous thoughts towards others. There's a second consequence. Second is a feeling of discontentment in our hearts with what we have. And notice the result. The result is covetousness. He says, you covet and cannot obtain. You covet and cannot obtain. Thou shalt not covet is the last of God's Ten Commandments, and it's, it's, it's the sin of desiring that which belongs to another. But at its root is a discontentment with what God has given you and a desire to have more. For instance, if you make success or money your passion or pleasure, you're ha you're never have enough. Because if you have one car, you're going to want what? If you have two cars, you're going to want what? And you're going to want three. If you have a nice house, you're going to want a nicer house. In fact, maybe John Rockefeller, the founder of Standard Oil Company, who's actually, whose actual wealth is three times richer compared to the gross uh, GDP today, uh, times richer than the money that Je Jeffrey Bezos, the founder of Amazon, has. When he was asked how much money is enough, he replied what? A little more. And if we make that our God, we'll never have enough. We'll never be content with what God has given us, and we'll covet and cannot obtain. <laughs> I'll tell you who's really good at that. The children of Israel were good at that, weren't they? When you go back and you remember how they were in the wilderness and God had graciously provided for them manna, but they got tired of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Okay, maybe they didn't have peanut butter and jelly. I don't know, but it's probably French toast. They get tired of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and French toast. So what'd they do? They said, oh, I remember when we were back in Egypt. We had onions and we had pot roast. That's what we had. With, we had pot roast with potatoes and, and then we had fish and we had all kinds of things. In fact, and so they began to complain to Moses and to God. Exodus or Numbers 11 says this, now the rabble, I, 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 just, I just love the brutality of the word, now the rabble, okay, uh, the rabble that was among them had a strong craving, and the people, a selfish desire, right? And the people of Israel also wept again and said, oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that, that cost nothing. The cuc and that, that cost nothing? What do you mean? Just cut your lives, for crying out loud. Okay. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. That's where I got the pot roast. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna, to look at. See, they had something, but they wanted more, and they were discontent, and it caused them to covet even what they had when they were back in Israel or in, in, uh, in Egypt. And it's amazing what God does. God gives them what they wanted, and what happens? They get sick, and they die while the meat is still in their mouth. You can read it. In Numbers 11, 31, 33, and all this, and, and while the meat was yet between their teeth before it was consumed, the anger of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord struck down the people with a very great plague. Here's the thing 
you don't want what God hasn't given you. You might think you do, but you don't want what God hasn't given you because it may kill you. Maybe not literally, but maybe it will kill your spirit. Maybe it will kill a relationship. You don't want what God hasn't given you. Because if you do, it might kill you. So what causes quarrels and fightings among you? Quarrels and fightings come from our selfish desires when everyone wants their own way and no one wants to submit their ways to God or to one another. And notice the result is first, murderous thoughts. And second, it's a feeling of discontentment with what God has given us. But now there's a third one, and that's failure to pray. You desire and you do not have, so you murder, you covet, and you cannot obtain, so you fight, and you do not have because you do not ask. There are two kinds of people in this world. That's one famous movie quote, those who like Neil Diamond and those who don't. But if you've never seen the movie, it won't relate. Seriously, there are two kinds of people in this world. There are those who see everything they have as a gift from God and are grateful. And there are those who see everything they have as something they earned and that they deserve. And if they don't have it, then they're bitter. And worse, they forget to pray. Or they never pray. People James is writing to seem to be those in the second group, those who see everything as something that they've worked for and something they deserve, and the result is their failure to pray and instead of turning to God in prayer as the giver of every good and perfect gift, they trust in themselves and what they can do. And they have murderous thoughts towards one another, and they covet, and they forget to pray. But now there's a fourth consequence of conflict, which comes from our selfishness, and that is uh, and the lack of surrender to one another and to God. Fourth is praying with the wrong motives. If they do pray, they pray selfishly. <laughs> Look at it. Because you ask wrongly, and you, all, you ask and you do not receive, and because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions, on your selfish desires. Did you catch that? They were praying, but they were praying for what? Praying for what they wanted and not for what God was willing to give them. Praying not according to God's will. In fact, it's interesting if you walk your way through Scripture, and we're just going to do that for a second, there's at least five prayers that God promises to answer. And again, you might want to not the, note these down. Five prayers God promises to answer. First is prayers that are prayed in faith or trust in God. That's what James says, James 1, 6. He says, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. And second are prayers prayed in Jesus' name. John 16, 24, until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy will be full. Third is prayers that are prayed according to God's will. 1 John 5, 14 says, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So we need to ask in faith. We need to ask uh, in his name, but we need to ask according to his will. And fourth, our prayers that are prayed when we are in right relationship with others. This is convicting, men, and I think it applies to all of us. First Peter chapter 3, verse 7 says, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you in the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. If you, if you need a motivation to love your wife, Maybe one motivation is so your prayers will be answered. And number five, prayers that are prayed with no unconfessed sin. Psalm 66, 18, if I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. So let me ask you this. When's the last time you had a prayer that was answered? When's the last time you had a direct answer to prayer? Was it recently or has it been a while? If it's been a while, maybe it's because you haven't asked. Or maybe it's because you've asked wrongly. You've asked without faith. You've asked without praying in Jesus' name. You've asked without praying according to his will. You've asked while not being in a right relationship with others. And you've asked with unconfessed sins in your heart. And maybe as our text says, you've asked to spend it on your own pleasures. Now, there's one more consequence of someone who selfishly wants his or her way over others or, or worse, over God's, and that is friendship with the world. 
It's again in verse 4. He says, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Here's the thing. When we don't get what we want from God, what do we do? Usually we try to get it ourselves. And we usually try to get it illegitimately. I think about that, and I'll give an illustration. I think about that in the context of marriage. God has intended marriage and, and the marriage bed to be undefiled. But when we don't get what we want in marriage, what do we do? We go outside of marriage. So what does James call the, the, these people when they go outside of God to get what it is, their selfish desires that they want? What's he call them? The same thing an unfaithful husband is. He says, you adulterous people. This is James. This is the pastor. This is the guy who for nine times has called them brothers and sisters, and now he calls them adulterous people, adulterers and adulteresses. Now, that'd, be, that'd make it fun to come to church, wouldn't it? But James is serious about their relationship with God, and, and, and loving the world is enmity with God. Or is, is enmity with God. It's adultery, and we know better than that in marriage, but do we know better than that with God? Sometimes we don't. And the reason we don't is we are so consumed with our selfish desires, with getting what we want, and not surrendering or submitting to others or submitting to God. And being content with what He's given us. So let me say it in another way. They were they are like adulterers and adulteresses cheating on God to get what they want rather than trusting him to give them what they need. It is trusting the world to give us what we want and not trusting God to give us what we need. So let me sum it up. What's the cause or conflict of conflict? What doesn't come from your crazy uncle or your loony mother-in-law or even from Satan, but it comes from within and from our selfish des desires at war within us. And what are the consequences? Their murderous thoughts towards others, their discontentment in our hearts, their failure to pray, their prayer with the wrong motives, and their friendship with the world. And next week, please, I told Justin earlier, I said, sometimes I think that next week's going to be the most important, I think, I think I'm going to, you know, it's going to be the most important message. And, 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 and I think that every week, that's my problem. But maybe it's because it's the Word of God, right? And I do think that next week is so important, especially when we live in the divided states of America. What's the solution? It's not blue, it's not black, it's not white, it's not red, it's God. And what does God say is the solution? But before we look at that next week, let me ask you this as we leave. And again, we do this so that we can keep the conversation going. Number one, is there someone you're in conflict with today? Is there someone you're in conflict with today? Maybe it's in the church. Maybe it's in the world. Maybe it's someone who, does, who looks different than you or maybe someone who, looks, who thinks differently than you. Who is it? If you're really brave, name them and name what it is. And then secondly, what have been the consequences of your quarreling or arguing with them? Have there been murderous thoughts? Is there a discontentment in your heart where you covet what they have? Is there a failure to pray? Is there, is there praying with the wrong motives? And is there friendship with the world, adultery in your relationship with God? Whatever it is, maybe today God's calling you to confess that. Not only your selfishness, but the consequences of that and your lack of trusting and surrendering and submitting to him. Let's pray. Father, we are by nature a selfish people. We want our way. We don't always want the way of others, and we don't always want your way. Forgive us for our selfishness and the murderous thoughts that we have towards others and the discontentment that we have towards you that causes us to forget to pray. Or worse, Lord, that causes us to pray selfishly. Help us instead to remember that you are a good God. A good God who gives us good gifts every day. The greatest gift of which is your Son. 
who by his shed blood on the cross purchased our salvation and made us your son and your daughter and you our father through faith in Jesus Christ. We thank you for what you've given us and we ask for your forgiveness for our selfish ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Praise God and thank you, Jesus, for all of you. It is such a blessing to see you all this morning. Um, we've truly missed you, and we've been looking forward to this day to getting back together. Uh, we've been been praying for you, and hopefully you've been praying for us. You know, it's been it's been quite a challenge just navigating how to do ministry without people. You know, it doesn't make much sense. And uh, but it, we're definitely glad you're here. One thing that's been uh, exciting and an answer to prayer, and we thank God for this, is this building. Uh, we've been praying for a long time for, that God would show us where he wants us to go. And now we have um, Vista has actually moved out and God opened the doors for us to be able to use this building. And we have our own space for now. And uh, just preparing for that's been uh, it's been a lot of work, but honestly, it's been a good distraction and uh, just preparing. And we I want to say a special thank you to those that worked really, really hard and stayed here many, many hours and getting uh, everything ready. Everything you see up here was completely gone because that was Vista's, and so we had to replace that. So it's been a lot of work, uh, but we praise God that we have a home for now and, and that he answered that, those prayers. Um, it's a special thank you to you, and, and that's all of you online as well, uh, for your uh, faithful giving uh, during all this time. And uh, obviously at first it was a little crazy on how to give, uh, but we kind of got that situated, and now uh, it's a little bit different. You can still you can still give online, um, as always, through our website, and you can also uh, mail the giving into the P.O. Box. Uh, but if you're here with us this morning, uh, there's a basket in the back, and so there's a third way you can give, and just drop that in um, on your way out. So uh, we thank you again. Uh, we hope you will join us uh, next week as we look at uh, God's solution for uh, division and see what his word has to say. Um, but uh, thank you so much for coming, and we'll see you next week.